Would you take your Bible this morning and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter in the Old Testament. And then turn back to the 13th chapter in 1 Samuel. Today we're beginning a new series that will take us through the summer months entitled Following God's Heart. And we're going to be looking at the life of David who is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Scripture tells us to seek after God with all of our heart. And yet so many people today are serving God or attempting to serve Him in a half-hearted sort of way. But God wants His people to be a people of passion, to make sure that we're serving God with every bit of our heart. And so that's what we're looking at. How do you do that? What does it mean to serve God with all your heart? And how is it possible for you and me to do that very thing? We're going to begin with this verse in 1 Samuel 13 as we stand together to honor the Lord and to thank Him for His Word. And just a portion of verse 14 in 1 Samuel 13. Look at the middle of that verse. It says, The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. Now God's looking today for men and women like that. For men and women after his own heart. Does that describe you? Would that be an adequate description of you this morning to say that you are a person of God's own heart? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the Word of God, and we pray that you would teach us today from your Word. Help us to search our own heart and see if we're following you with passion, to see if we are indeed men and women following you with our own heart. Thank you for the life of David as an example to us. Lord, we know that he was not perfect, that he sinned. But we also know that he was quick to repent. And you spoke of him as a man after your own heart. So Lord, help us to be just like him in the way that we follow after you. In the name of Jesus we pray and God's people said, Thank you. Be seated and turn to the 17th chapter. And in this 17th chapter we see the background that we're using today to look at what it means to be a person after God's own heart. And I want to set the stage for this message by showing you three things in this chapter, just kind of outlining the chapter. And then I'm going to share with you five characteristics that were evident in the life of David that really enabled him to be a man that followed God's own heart. And these principles are transferable principles. They come right out of the Word of God from His life, and they're principles that you and I can put in our heart and our life and begin living today. And if we do that, then we're going to to be like He was and wind up as a person who truly follows God with our whole heart. But I want you to notice first the challenge that he faced in the first 11 verses of 1 Samuel 17. In this chapter, we find the story of David and Goliath. So he faced what could have seemed to many people like an insurmountable challenge. He was fighting this giant. But there's more to the story than that meets the eye. And we're going to see when we get to the end of it what it's really all about or the underlying message in the story But there is a a real challenge going on here in David's life. And if you look at those first three verses, it describes for us what is taking place as this challenge begins. The Philistines are gathered over here on one cliff, a a mountain, and the Israelites are over here on another cliff, a mountain, and there's a, a valley in between about the size of a football field, and Every day, every morning, and again every evening, this giant named Goliath comes down into the middle of that valley and he calls out a challenge to the Israelites asking an Israeli soldier to come down and fight him. And he's been doing that 
for six weeks and nobody's taken him up on his challenge. Now, why is that? Well, it's probably because of the size of the challenge. If you look at verse 4 and the verses that follow, we see some things about Goliath. We see how big he was. In verse 4, the Bible says his height was six cubits and a span. Now that means old Goliath was somewhere between nine feet six inches tall and nine feet nine inches tall. So you could stand him up under a basketball goal and it would be four inches from his head, the top of his head. I mean, Goliath, wouldn't the NBA pay millions and millions of dollars for him today? He could just hold his arms up and just dunk it like that, not even have to, to jump at all. Nine, imagine that, nine feet six inches. I'm six feet six inches. He'd be three feet taller than me. I'd like to get around him a little bit so I could feel short. But Goliath, what kind of man was he? And and he weighed probably four to five hundred pounds. Now what a man. Do you understand why nobody would take up that challenge? When he came down into that valley and he began to issue the challenge for somebody to fight him, and nobody would. We're also told that he was armed. If you look at verses 5 through 7, it says he had a helmet of bronze and a coat made out of brass. And that coat weighed between 125 pounds and 200 pounds. He had to be a a pretty big guy just to wear a coat that weighed about 200 pounds. And then it talks about his spear being like a weaver's beam And if you put that in our vernacular today, it would have been about the size of a small telephone pole. And the end of that spear, we're told, was about 15 to 20 pounds in weight itself. But you know the thing that amazes me is in verse 7. In verse 7, the Bible says, And a shield bearer went before him. Why did he need one? I mean, why would a man like that need a shield bearer? So here is this giant whose name is Goliath. And in verses 8 through 10, we see him issuing a challenge. According to verse 16, he did that every morning and every evening for a period of six weeks. And the Israelites listened to that time and time again. Verse 11 says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, I want to ask you this morning, if you have any challenges in your life, do you have any Goliaths in your life right now? Maybe a giant of sickness that you're dealing with, or a giant of temptation, or a family problem that you're trying to work out, or a financial giant, some giant in your life that is attacking you, and you hear the sound of the challenge, And you hear it every morning when you wake up. And you hear it every night when you pillow your head on your bed. And and this challenge just looms large in your life. And it looks insurmountable to you. And you don't know what to do with it. And you can't escape from it. And it's there to meet you every morning and every night. And you think you're going to go crazy because you just don't know what to do. David faced that kind of of challenge, the challenge he faced. But I want you to see what happened because of the champion he was. You see, there was something about David that made him a champion of the living God. There was something about David that enabled him to face the challenge in front of him without fear. And the thing that was in David, the characteristics in David's life that enabled him to be a man after God's own heart are the same characteristics that God wants you and me to build in our lives that will enable us to face the challenges that come to us the same way David faced Goliath. So we see here the champion that he was. And there are five things I want to show you about his life. Look at verse 12 in our text. In chapter 17, verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. 
And then he tells you the names. And look at verse 14. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Now here's what I want you to see about David. As you begin to read about David's life, it becomes immediately obvious that that David was consistent in the routine things of life. And if you're going to become a man or a woman of God's own heart, you have to learn to be consistent in the routine things of life. You have to be faithful in the small things before God's going to trust you with the big things. You have to be faithful in the little things before God will come along and give you a larger assignment. And David was consistent in the routine things of life. You have to remember now, David is the king in waiting. He's waiting for the moment that he will take over the kingdom, yet he was consistent in the routine things. David understood that he had to be patient, that he was not to get ahead of God's schedule. He accepted God's timing in his life, and he knew God's timing is always perfect. How many times have we gotten ourselves in trouble because we've run out in front of God? Can you say amen? How many times have we gotten in trouble because we didn't pray something through, but we got impatient and we took it into our own hands and we ran out in front of God? David did not do that. David learned to be consistent in the routine things of life. He understood that God is always on time. God is never one moment too early. God is never one second late. God has a plan and purpose for your life and for my life at this very moment. And we're just to go about being consistent in the routine things of life and let God unfold His plan and His purpose in our life. Now the problem is we want to take control. We want it to be the way we want it instead of the way that God wants it. And so we step in and we take control. And when we take control, we're headed for trouble every single time. So learn this lesson. If you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, it begins with being consistent in the routine things of life. You be consistent in your prayer life. You be consistent in your Bible study. You be consistent in your daily walk with Christ. You are consistent in the routine things of life. If you understand me, say amen. Then look down at verse 26 and the following verses, and you see something else in David's life. David went down to camp to take some food to his brothers. And in verse 26... It says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Look at verse 27. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. And then they go on and tell him about Saul's incentive plan. Now here's what's happening. Because David is consistent in the routine things, his father sent him to take some food to his brothers on the battlefield. And in his consistency, he finds himself challenged by the impossible. And that's what's going to happen to you and to me. If we are going to be people after God's own heart, as we are living a life of consistency in the routine things of our life, there will be a a challenge come along And it will confront us, and it will be an impossible challenge. It will be something that we can't handle on our own. It will be something that we can't deal with on our own. And God always orchestrates that or allows it to come into our life in order to show us we can't do it, but He can. He can do it. And so David was challenged here by the impossible things. In fact, in verse 25, the soldiers tell David about Saul's incentive plan. And and you read about it, and and there's three things for the man who defeats Goliath. The king's going to make him rich immediately. He'll bestow him with riches. The king's going to give him his daughter's hand in marriage. Now, I don't know what she looked like. The Bible doesn't say. I don't know if if he would have wanted her or not. But uh, 
that was part of the prize. You get the king's daughter, maybe he's trying to get rid of her, I don't know. But you get the king's daughter and you get the king's money, and then you never have to pay income taxes again, and that one sounds pretty good to me, amen? I mean, David said this is an incentive plan, but you know what? He didn't go and fight the giant because there was an incentive plan. He went to fight the giant because he knew that he was a man who lived by faith and not by fear. Even though the challenge seemed impossible, he knew there was a God in heaven who could get the job done. So he decides to volunteer. He was challenged by impossible things. And that's how people whose hearts are bent toward God who follow God with their whole heart will live. They, they, they don't see what everybody else sees. They see what God sees. They don't hear what everybody else hears. They hear what God hears. And when they look at a challenge, other people look at that challenge and they say, oh, we can't do that. Oh, that's impossible. But no, when a man or a woman is following God with their whole heart, they're looking through God's eyes. They're seeing with God's heart. And they say, here is a challenge that may be impossible to me, but nothing is impossible to God. Can you say amen? That's how God wants us to live. That's how David lived. That's how we will live when we follow God with our whole heart. But let me show you something else down in verse 28. Here's a third characteristic in his life. In verse 28, the Bible says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. Now here's what's happening. David is challenged by the impossible thing. And the minute he makes up his mind to do what God wants him to do, just as soon as he makes up his mind, ridicule sets in. He is committed, though, in spite of ridicule. He is committed in spite of ridicule. I mean, the minute he makes up his mind that he's going to go for God, that he's going to follow God with his whole heart, that very moment he begins to be persecuted. And who's persecuting him? His own brother. His, his own family. His own family is questioning his motives. He is being questioned by his own people. And the devil is trying to get him off track now because there's a reason I'm going to show you in just a minute why the devil wants to get him off track. So he's committed in spite of ridicule. And if you look down at verse 29, David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? And then go on down to verse 33 and you see the persecution and ridicule continues. It says, Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. The king said, You can't fight him. He's a, he's a warrior. He's a giant. He'll kill you. You're just a little boy. Does not Timothy say, Let, thou, let no man despise what? Thy youth. I want to tell you young people something. Don't you let anybody talk you out of doing what God calls you to do. Don't you let anybody ridicule you out of being everything that God has called you to be. There are some negative people in this world, and there are people who will tell you every reason why you can't, but if God tells you you can, you can. And you make up your mind who you're going to listen to. Don't you listen to the people who say can't. You listen to the God who says can. Because you and God can do anything. The Bible says is anything too hard for the Lord. The Bible says with all things, God, with God all things are possible. So you be committed in spite of ridicule. And then I see a fourth thing in his life. That enabled him to be a man after God's own heart. If you go down to verse 34 and you begin to read these verses. You're going to see that he was courageous in the Lord. He was courageous in the Lord. And he, he told the king a story. He said, king, listen. I, 
I've fought against a lion and I've fought against a bear and God gave me victory over the lion and over the bear. And if God gave me victory over the lion and the bear, God will give me victory over this giant. Where did his courage come from? His courage came because he was a man who followed God with his whole heart. And you don't have anything to fear when you follow God with your whole heart. There's nothing to be afraid of. And the Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. David's past victories encouraged his present success. And here's the fifth characteristic I see in his life. In verse 38 and verse 39, the old king said, well, son, he's going to kill you. But if you're bound and determined to go, at least put my armor on. And Saul was a tall man, and David was a boy, and so the armor wouldn't fit David. The king's armor wouldn't fit David. And so David just said, I can't do this. I can't wear your armor. And and if you read this story, you see what happens. Down in verse 40, the Bible says he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, and his sling was in his hand. Why five stones? Was he afraid he was going to miss? No, Goliath had four brothers. Did you know that? Goliath had four brothers. And David said, if I have to, I'll take the giant out. And if his family comes after me, I'll take the whole family out. He took five stones. One for Goliath and one for his brothers. You see, that's faith. His courage was in the Lord. And when you're walking with God, when you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, your courage is going to be in the Lord. He said, I don't need your armor. Just give me these five stones and I'll go before this giant in the courage of the Lord, in the power of God Almighty. And you get down to verses 45 and you see, You see what's going on behind the scenes. You see, God had promised. God had promised that Jesus Christ would one day come into the world through the lineage of David. Now, if David had lost that battle that day, if Goliath had killed David, you and I could not be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ because Jesus would have never come into the world. God had already said He was coming through the lineage of David. And so David went into that battle in the the courage of the Lord. His faith was in God. And I want to tell you something. When God makes you a promise in His Word, you need to believe it and you need to bank on it and you need to live as if it's already come to pass because God's Word is God's Word. Amen? I mean, God's Word is God's Word. If God says it, it is settled in heaven and you're just waiting for it to happen on earth. And David knew how to live by the Word of God. So what's the application for you and me? Well, I think there are three very quickly. The first application is this. Confront your challenges. Confront your challenges. If you live for Jesus, you're going to have one challenge after another, after another. And they're not going away. So confront your challenges in the Lord. And a man or a woman after God's own heart, is going to be bold enough to step up and confront their challenges. Don't be afraid. Confront your challenges. Second, cherish your trophies. I think there's a a life lesson here that teaches us that we're not to bury our past victories, but we're to cherish them. David was encouraged to fight Goliath because he had already beaten the lion and the bear. And in fact, the Bible says down in verse 54 that David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and he put the armor in his tent. Why? Why did David take Goliath's armor and put it in his tent? Every morning when he woke up, he saw the armor of the giant. And it reminded him that God had given him the victory. 
and he drew strength from past victories when he faced future challenges. And you and I, if you've lived for Jesus for any period of time at all, you've experienced a challenge or two along the way. And some of them are tough. And God has given you victory. And you need to hold on to those past victories and cherish them and let them be trophies of grace, the grace and faithfulness of God because there's another challenge out there and it's coming around the corner and it's going to try to knock the props out from under you. But you can remember how God was faithful to you in the past. And the same God who was faithful to help you in the past will be the God who will help you when the next challenge comes. Can you say amen? Here's the third and last application. I think this teaches us that we're to concentrate on God's purpose for our life and nothing else. We just concentrate on God's purpose for our life. David would not let his critics deter him. He focused on his goal. He committed himself to God wholehearted, full of passion. And when we live, the challenges will come. And we're to face them in the strength of the Lord and never let up, never give up. You see what happened that day? There was two giants that met each other that day. We think Goliath was the giant, and he was. But there were two other giants behind the scenes that were meeting that day. There was the giant of fear, and there was the giant of faith. And when fear comes knocking at the door, If faith answers, there'll be nobody there. Because the giant of fear can never stand next to the giant of faith. Did you know that? David learned to follow God with his whole heart by faith. And that's how he wants us to live. That's how God wants us to live, by faith. And today I'm going to ask you, in a moment as we stand to sing, If you have not placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to make that decision today. Here in the auditorium and over in the Christian Life Center, just now in a moment as we stand to sing this invitation, I'm going to ask you to step out and come forward by faith, placing your life in Jesus Christ to save you. And maybe you're facing a challenge today. And you know now how to take these principles and implement them in your life so you can live by faith and not fear and overcome these challenges in your life. And I invite you to pray today and ask God to help you as you walk this life by faith. Let's stand together. Our Father in heaven, may your will be done in this place in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You come as we sing. You come. Go ahead and have a seat. And we're going to finish our service today with a parent-child dedication service. And we have four uh, to dedicate to the Lord this morning. And as I call their name, I'm going to ask uh, the family to The parents just come and stand here, and in just a moment I'll invite the rest of the family to come forward as well. But we begin today with uh, Ty Allen Bumgarner. Parents are Michael and Kathy Bumgarner. Okay, that's okay. Hey, Erica, I forgot to ask you to bring them in, didn't I? Uh, I thought you had them, and it dawned on me that they were still in the back. Oh, we have them all now? Yeah, we have all the children. The, okay, yeah, I'm going to in a minute. Then we have uh, Holden Ford Dietz, Ben and Heather Dietz. All right. And Elena, June Epling, John and Lovey Epling. And Liam Christopher Lotze. And this is Chris and D. Lotze.
<laughs> now, folks, if you'll just turn and face me for just a moment, I want to just say a couple things to you. What we're doing today is dedicating you and your children to the Lord, to the safekeeping of the Lord. And our church family is saying to you that we will stand with you to raise your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus. And we're going to give you in just a moment a little Bible for you to begin uh, reading to your child. It's not too soon to, be, to put the Word of God into the heart of your child. And then we're going to give you a letter uh, from me to your child to be opened when your child is eight years old that tells your child what we did here today and gives you an opportunity to lead them to faith in Jesus Christ uh, on their eighth birthday. So we're delighted to have you here to dedicate uh, your child and to dedicate yourselves unto the Lord. And I want to ask you to turn back around now and face the congregation. And, and I want to ask family members and friends to come and stand around your family. And we're going to pray together. Uh, all the family members and friends in your uh, Sunday school or your small group uh, classes, you just come and stand around your family. Okay, church family, if you will agree to stand with these, to support them and to pray for them as, and, as they nur and nurture these children in the Lord, would you stand as we pray together? And let's pray now. Our Father, what a joy it is this morning to dedicate to you Ty Allen Bumgarner, Holden Ford Dietz, Elena June Epling, and Liam Christopher Lotze. And Lord, their parents, Michael and Kathy and Ben and Heather, John and Lovey and Chris and Dee, we dedicate them to you, Lord, to your safekeeping. We ask you to bless them. We ask you, Lord, to help them as they raise these children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we pray for the children that the day will come when they will have the privilege to lead these boys and girls to faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for their birth for the joy they are, and thank you for the time when they will be born again. Lord, as a church, it is our privilege and joy to stand with them today. In the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. How about a big hand to the Lord for these families? <clears throat> 